welcome to Sunday Morning with Hope Valley Church. And today we're going to be finishing up our three-part series on the life of David, where we've been looking at three specific times in David's life when he went through a lot of suffering and learning from the way that David responded during those times. Uh, but before we get started, let's go ahead and pray and just open our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this day. And God, I pray that you would once again give us ears to hear and to receive your word and your truth this morning. Lord, transform us, teach us, grow us, and mature us by your word. And we thank you for it. In your name, amen. So last week, uh, we talked about a time in David's life when his suffering was totally his fault. And the week before, we talked about a time in David's life when his suffering was not his fault at all. But if you've been alive very long, you know that oftentimes the suffering and the difficult seasons that we go through are usually a mixture of both, right? They're kind of a mixture of things that are our fault and some things that are not, right? Because life is pretty complicated. And today we're going to be looking at a time like that in David's life when he was going through some suffering that was partly his fault, but also partly not his fault at all. And we're going to see how David responded. You know, when we're going through times like this, I think often we can be tempted to focus on ourselves as the victim. Uh, we can be tempted to, you know, oversimplify the situation and to fail to take responsibility for our own part in those circumstances. But we don't see David doing that. And I think uh, the way that he responds uh, in today's story is going to really help us kind of think through how we ought to respond as well. So you may remember last week, uh, right, we talked about how David uh, was confronted with all this sin of what he had done in the lives of uh, Uriah and Bathsheba and by covering it all up. And as a consequence of the violence and sexual sin that David had privately, and that's a key word there, that he had privately inflicted on Uriah and Bathsheba's family, God told David that one of the consequences of that is that violence and sexual sin would publicly plague David's family. Uh, God actually said, what you have done in private uh, will be done to you in public, right? And this is one of the consequences of what David had done. Well, within a few years, we see that Amnon, who is one of David's sons, sexually assaults Tamar, which is Amnon's half-sister and one of David's daughters. Well, Absalom, who's another one of David's sons, and he's a uh, full brother to Tamar, finds out about it. And he murders Amnon uh, two years later as revenge for assaulting his sister Tamar. Uh, afterward, Absalom goes and lives away from the family for a while until eventually David does invite Absalom to return back to Jerusalem. But even after this, David doesn't go to see Absalom actually for like another two years. And he only sees Absalom after Absalom pleads to be brought to David. Presumably, between his anger over his sister's assault, his father David's apparent inaction regarding the assault, and the poor treatment that he, result, uh, that he received after doing what he felt was right, uh, Absalom plans an insurrection against David. Well, David ends up fleeing Jerusalem and surrendering the throne to Absalom. Absalom then even makes a public show of having sexual relations with David's concubines on the roof of David's palace. And he does this in order to humiliate David. And this actually happens all just as God had told David it would happen. So things are not going well. Things are not going well for David. And there's a mixture of things that are David's mistakes and there's a mixture of things that are Absalom's mistakes and bad decisions. Well, while on the run from Absalom, David encounters a man who was one of the remaining members of King Saul's family. This man comes out and he uh, curses David, saying that David deserves everything that is happening to him. And that is where we pick up the story. So we see here in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is what this man from Saul's family comes out. And he begins to shout this at David. He says, get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel. The Lord is paying you back for all the bloodshed in Saul's clan. 
You stole his throne, and now the Lord has given it to your son, Absalom. At last you will taste some of your own medicine, for you are a murderer. Now, the men around David respond as you expect that they would, and here's the actual conversation that David has with his men as this man is cursing David. In verse uh, 9 of 2 Samuel chapter 16, David and his men have this following conversation. Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king, Abishai, son of Zeruiah, demanding? Let me go over and cut off his head. <laughs> no, the king said. Who asked your opinion, you sons of Zeruiah? If the Lord has told him to curse me, who are you to stop him? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, My own son is trying to kill me. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone and let him curse. For the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. Now, if we go over to Psalm chapter 3, we see uh, a song written by David during this time of his life when he was on the run from Absalom. And it gives us some insight into the way that David was thinking and praying to the Lord. Uh, in Psalm 3, verse 2, we see David writes, So many are saying, God will never rescue him. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cry out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid of ten thousand enemies who surround me on every side. So again, I think there's three specific things we see David doing in his own life during a very complex situation, right? David is dealing simultaneously with some of the consequences and the fallout in his own family that are a result of what he did in the family of somebody else, right? He brought violence and sexual sin against Uriah's family. And now those very same things are happening to his own family as a consequence. But those other things David is suffering that aren't his fault at all. His son Absalom is uh, evicting David from the throne and uh, stirring up an insurrection and a revolt against David. And some of those things are not David's fault at all. So David's in a very complex situation. Uh, and it's very challenging for him. And uh, as you can imagine, very discouraging. And here comes this guy out and he's cursing David. And he's saying some things to David that really are not fair or not true. David didn't steal the, uh, the, uh, the throne from Saul, right? That's one example of something that's not true. And David knew that wasn't true, but David didn't defend himself. He didn't rebuke this man, but he just trusted the Lord. And we see David having that same kind of a heart in that psalm that he wrote during this time. So I think the first thing we see David doing here is that David did not act like a victim. Or defend himself. Look, I think if we focus on other people's blame, right? If we, if we focus on how other people are at fault and, and where their blame lies, rather than just simply owning our own, we will block our own opportunity for growth and correction. So David doesn't make that mistake. He doesn't act like a victim. He doesn't spend time defending himself. It's very interesting. Second thing we see David doing is he acknowledges his own part in the suffering that he was enduring. And I think that when we take responsibility for our own wrongdoing first, and we invite correction and we invite growth into our lives. And then the third thing we see David doing, and it's so clear, is that David just simply trusted God to sort it all out based on his experience of who God is. You know, this is a time later in David's life when he's been through a lot, and we've already seen in detail two really difficult seasons of David's life. 
And David had learned some things about God. And, and David understood God's character and what God was like. And now David's able to go, you know what? I'm just going to trust God to sort this whole thing out because it's too complicated of a mess for me to try to, you know, assign blame and figure out where I'm right and where I'm wrong and all these things. I'm just going to own where I know I'm wrong. And I'm going to trust God to sort the rest of it out. And I think that when we remember what we have learned about God's character, our anxiety and maybe our defensiveness can begin to diminish. So what should you and I do with what we're learning today? I think the first step, again, very, very clear. Do not act like a victim. When you find yourself in a complicated situation, and some of it's your fault and some of it's not, choose to not behave and act and talk like a victim of that situation. Instead, just take ownership of the part that is yours, right? Uh, the second thing we want to do is we want to recognize lies. Sometimes when we're in complicated situations, people are going to speak lies against us and they, and they you know, might think that they know why the situation is the way that the situation is, uh, but they're wrong and they don't have all the details. And so uh, just like this man comes out and is yelling at David and saying, this is all coming on you because of what you did to Saul. Actually, these things were not happening to David because of what happened to Saul. So, uh, David acted really well towards Saul, and actually it was God who brought all those things on Saul, not David. But th David did know these things were happening, not because of what he did to Saul, but because of what he did to Uriah and Bathsheba. And so David chooses, you know what? I recognize that's a lie, but I'm going to let him speak. And it's so interesting what David says here in verse 12. He says, perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged, and he will bless me because of these curses today. So the second thing is we want to recognize lies. We don't want to listen and receive everything, right? Recognize the lies, but own the part that is ours, right? Recognize the truth. And then the third thing is, again, we want to trust God to sort out the complicated things of our lives. You and I both know there are some situations we're going through, and they're very complicated, Exactly who is to blame, exactly why is it the way that it is, uh, exactly what needs to be done, uh, and what the con consequences should be, can often be too much for us to think through. And if we take things into our own hands, we're probably going to make a mess of it. And so we want to do what David did, and just rely on God, find our peace and our presence in Him, and trust Him to sort those things out. Look, I think that if we all dig this, we would find more peace in difficult times. And I think that we would have more grace and more patience for one another as we make a decision to own our own mistakes rather than being so quick to assign blame to the people around us. Let me give you a few questions to uh, discuss today. Now, whether you're at home uh, you got some family and friends around you, maybe just later this week. These would be some great questions for you to discuss and just kind of think through. Uh, the first one is, are the problems and challenges that we face in life typically our fault, not our fault, or are they most often a mixture of both? Second question, what are the benefits of taking responsibility for the part that we play in our own suffering? It's an interesting question to think about. And then the third one is, how can we have peace when the other party in a conflict won't take responsibility or reconcile with us? That can be really hard. So that's an interesting question for you to think about and discuss this week. And then... Those next three questions are really meant for your private time alone with the Lord. So as you spend time praying, maybe you do some devotions, you journal, these are some questions that are going to be more invasive, kind of probing, that I encourage you to just take into your time with God. Uh, pray through these questions and see what the Lord is saying to you. First question is this. In what ways have you preferred to see yourself as a victim of the situations of your life? It's a hard question, I know, but I really encourage you to dive into that one. The second question is, are you going 
through a difficult time now, or maybe you have in the past, where you are resisting acknowledging your own responsibility in that matter. And then the third question is, how can inviting God's peace and love into your life today set you free to take responsibility for your own actions and choices? Some pretty heavy questions to think through for sure. So, um, you know, I just encourage you to take that time in prayer and I I really expect God's going to show you really some transformative things. Anyway, we're glad you've been with us today. Uh, Just pray that God will bless you richly today and this week. And uh, we thank you for being here. All right. Love you. Bye-bye. We are so glad you have joined us today. If you'd like to find out more about Hope Valley Church and what we're all about, just go to www.hopevalley.church. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook at Hope Valley 4SQ. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please take a moment to like and subscribe so you can stay up to date with new videos coming out every week. Hope Valley Church is a church based in Winchester, Virginia that meets in homes around the region. So if you'd like to find out more about home churches, how they work, and how to locate one near you, just go to hopevalley.church house. Thanks again, and may God bless you today.